brown dwarfs and Jupiter and Saturn have commonalities, I will argue to you, and are worth considering as a class. Um, let me first give you a brief summary of some of the relevant observations regarding the atmospheric dynamics regime on these, and then discuss in detail some of the problems uh, that I'm interested in. Brown dwarfs, are, they're thought to form like stars. Um, they are typically defined to be hydrogen objects of masses of order 10 to 80 Jupiter masses. Most of the ones we know, despite the previous talk, are isolated objects. There's no nearby star around them to radiate them. Uh, and they, if there are dozens of Jupiter masses, they can uh, still be very hot, even after many billions of years, despite just continuously pouring radiation out to space. And so many of them have temperatures at the top of 1,000 Kelvin or more, and they're relatively easy to observe in comparison to, say, hot Jupiters, uh, just because they're not being drowned out by a nearby star. And they're rapidly rotating um, with periods of typically 2 to 12 hours, which puts them in a, in a, a dynamical regime that's similar to that of Jupiter, a rotationally dominated regime different than that of a more slowly rotating hot Jupiter. And it turns out there's now quite a bit of evidence um, for atmospheric dynamics and circulation on these objects. We know clouds just from spectra and cloud particles need to be lofted uh, by mix mixing. There's also signatures of mixing in disequilibrium chemistry from CO and CH4. And interestingly, there's uh, many objects, most actually, for which there's variability in various infrared bands. This shows an example where in J-band, this object with a Orbital period with a rotation period of 2.4 hours has a flux that varies over time by about, say, 5% or so. And um, so that's interesting. And the interpretation is that you're seeing cloudy and cloud free regions, sort of patchiness, due mostly to clouds and also temperature. Um, and those patches are rotating in and out of view as the brown dwarf turns. And so you're seeing um, from Earth different faces of the brown dwarf at different times. And the cloudy, free, the cloud free regions, um, you're sensing the deeper layers of the atmosphere where it's hotter and the radiation is greater. And uh, the cloudy regions are cooler. And so that there's a patchiness in the flux actually that causes the total flux integrated um, uh, you know, signal that we see at Earth to vary. And interestingly, over time, so if you go back later, the period of course is the same because that's the rotation period, but the shape of the light curve is different. And that implies that the um, sort of uh, pattern of the patchiness on the surface of the brown dwarf is changing with time. So that's direct evidence for atmospheric circulation. It's not a static structure. And, um, and so it's interesting that there's no nearby star. So on Earth or a hot Jupiter, the dominant mechanism that drives the circulation is the gradient and st strength of absorbed starlight from, say, the equator to the pole or the day side to the night side, which induces large-scale horizontal pressure and temperature variations that, say, on the Earth drive the Hadley cell and the jet streams and all that. And the typical brown dwarf lacks that mechanism. So you have instead this brown dwarf, which has a very convective, a convectively active interior, and the convection is pounding against the bottom of a stratified atmosphere. Um, and the stratified atmosphere has no external baroclinicity, as we like to say. There's no external gradient from a star because there is no star. But you have um, this uh, convection pounding against the, the base of the stratified atmosphere. And that can generate waves, atmospheric waves, that can propagate up into the atmosphere. They can break, they can get absorbed, they can interact with each other. And that, in principle, can drive a circulation. In fact, we have an analogy for this in the solar system in the stratosphere of Earth and the giant planets, which in, in the circulation in the stratosphere of Earth is predominantly driven by this same mechanism. There is, of course, uh, variation in the strength of the absorbed sunlight, mainly uh, you know, you know, just due to ozone absorbing UV. There's a latitude gradient in that. But the dominant driver is this mechanism. And um, there's also evidence, um, there's now one brown dwarf where we have uh, patchiness observed um, by a nice paper from Ian Crossfield a few years ago. This is from the Doppler imaging technique. So a key question here then is, what is the circulation like in this regime? There have been some models like this one, a nice paper from almost 10 years ago now um, by Bernd Freitag showing um, you know, how you can produce these waves. But this is a small 2D box calculation just covering like 1% of the surface of the brown dwarf and doesn't apply to the overall interior and doesn't um, include rotation. So that's kind of the state of the art. And then switching to observations of the giant planets, we know they're banded. There's a nice talk on that we heard about earlier. So there's these nice zonal jets for Jupiter and Saturn. These are the measured east-west wind speed or zonal winds for Jupiter and Saturn, Uranus and Neptune. And so one could ask questions about what are the conditions under which you would expect an atmosphere to organize into this banded cloud structure uh, or this banded structure at all um, versus uh, being uh, comprising isot uh, isotropic turbulence or, you know, just being polka dotted by 100 different great red spots or whatever. And also, it turns out there are stratospheric oscillations on Jupiter and Saturn that are quite interesting. Um, this basically shows uh, the zonal mean temperature structure um, over time, over a 20-year period from the late 70s to about 2000. 
And the key point is just that the wiggle, their wiggles that uh, move up and down over time. And it turns out this has about a four year period. And so there's variations in the temperature with an te uh, uh, amplitude of order five to 10 Kelvin that vary over time in this way on Jupiter. The same thing occurs on Saturn. On Jupiter, this is called the quasi quadrennial oscillation or QQO due to its four year period. On Saturn, the same kind of oscillation has a period of 15 years, which interestingly is half a Saturn year. And because of the dynamical link um, between temperatures and winds on a rapidly rotating planet, um, these variations in temperature imply a variation in wind. And if you use um, just this, you know, do kind of a thermal wind sort of analysis, you can infer observationally what the wind pattern is doing. And basically the wind pattern consists of vertically stacked eastward and westward low latitude jets that are shown here. Um, and so red is eastward anomaly, blue is westward anomaly at the equator. This is latitude, this is for Saturn, latitude on the x-axis, uh, height on the y-axis. And the interesting thing is that the stacked pattern of eastward and westward jets migrates downward over time. So the location of this eastward jet has moved downward um, over the sort of five or six years from um, 2005 to 2010. This is from Cassini observations. So for Saturn, this is called the semi-annual oscillation or, SS, or SAO due to its, uh, the fact that it's half of the Saturn year length. Turns out there's an oscillation just like this on the Earth's atmosphere, which is well known and has been studied for half a century called the quasi-biennial oscillation or QBO. And this shows um, basically the east and west uh, word wind speeds at the equator over time from the 60s through about 1990. And so just imagine first to understand this, being at a single altitude, say 30 kilometers, and thinking about what happens over time. So 30 kilometers, the wind sign changes from westward to eastward to westward to eastward. So if you're at that one altitude, there's an equatorial jet, and the sign of the jet is switching back and forth every two years. You know, just like a, um, well, it's not exactly a signal clock because it's not that periodic. But anyway, so, and the cool thing is that the whole structure, if you look at the height structure, it moves downward over time. So the phasing of these alternating jets is different at different heights such that, you know, say this um, eastward jet moves downward over time, this westward jet moves downward and so on. And uh, the period is approximately two years, hence the name quasi-biennial oscillation. And I might add that this does not imply that the mass is moving downward. The, the zonal wind contours are not material surfaces, but the materials actually tend to be moving upward, you know, due to sort of a meridional circulation. We have this interesting oscillation. Now, for giant planets, there's never been um, a three-dimensional model that's captured this. So I'm interested in kind of globally considering these phenomena together, the zonal jets and these stratospheric oscillations. And so I, um, I'm doing a three-dimensional, I'm going to present three-dimensional atmospheric calculations using the primitive equations, which are the standard equations set for a stratified atmosphere. And so we're basically, we're not trying to represent the deep convection zone, but we kind of go through the atmosphere down to the top part of the convection zone. And we parameterize con uh, con the effect of convection by adding random perturbations at the base of the model. And the intention of those is just to push the material surfaces at the bottom of the model up and down in a random way that would sort of represent what convection might do. The characteristic uh, wave number or wavelength of these is a pre-parameter that we vary. Characteristic time scale, likewise, although these can be constrained by what you would expect the convection to do in the interior. So we have bounds on what we would expect. And we put this in intentionally as a spatially isotropic pattern, meaning in the forcing, there's no preferred directionality, east-west versus north-south. The only source of asymmetry or, um, or anisotropy, I should say, in this model is the rotation. So if banding occurs in this, it's solely due to the planetary rotation. This gives a sense of the vertical structure and kind of a low resolution version of the model. These colored bands are just to kind of guide your eye. The actual um, little squares on here show the model um, structure for a low resolution version. These are idealized calculations. So we put in the radiation just by Newtonian cooling where we damp to some times uh, the sort of temperature profile like this. Critical is that this is not a function of longitude or latitude. Um, this is only a function of height, which represents this fact that I mentioned earlier that most uh, objects do not have, most brown dwarfs do not have a nearby star. And so the radiative time scale is a free parameter. We have to use high resolution. So we uh, typically use 160 vertical levels, which is necessary to capture the wave behavior. So this shows several calculations um, of uh, the flow uh, through different simulations using different values, the radiative time constant. And so, uh, and as I mentioned, radiation acts as a damper in this system. Radiation is removing horizontal or trying to damp out horizontal temperature variations. So that's opposite of the role of radiation on say a hot Jupiter. Um, and uh, the forcing then is due to this, uh, the perturbations by convection at the base of the model.
So all of these uh, de de develop banded patterns. The left column shows temperature, or the right is the zonal wind, with red being eastward and blue being westward. And so you can see that when the radiative time constant is longer, that implies that the flow is, uh, has a weaker damping. So the wind speeds are stronger, reaching 400 meters a second. And uh, the flow forms this nice banded pattern, not as regular as Jupiter. Um, and I'll talk about that in a second, but still a nice banded pattern. And then when the radiative time constant is stronger, there's a tendency to confine the zonal flow to low latitudes. And the reason that occurs is because there's a latitudinal sensitivity to how to the efficiency of zonal jet formation. Zonal jets form most efficiently at low latitudes because of the ability to generate Rossby waves, which are critical for zonal jet formation at low latitudes. Some of these models can produce behavior that is quite similar to that of Jupiter and Saturn. This um, top model is an example of that. And the zonal wind field from that model is shown here, showing alternating east-west zonal jets um, with a nice equatorial super rotation at the equator. And then you get this flow kind of mixing, uh, homogenizing um, for the uh, dynamics aficionados out there. This is the potential vorticity. Um, basically, you get this nice staircase pattern. Um, and you can see this nice pattern of zonal jets, even hints of uh, polygons, sort of a hexagon-like structure here. This lower row is a model that's analogous, but it's more strongly forced and more strongly damp. So this might be a brown dwarf that's sort of intermediate between some of the really hot ones and Jupiter. Mm -hmm. And so what happens is the stronger forcing and the stronger damping, um, you still get a banded structure, but the stronger forcing and damping tries to disrupt that banded pattern. So what's, it takes time for the flow to organize into this banded pattern. So if the forcing and damping are really strong, it can disrupt that process before it goes to completion, which is why this lower model is less well banded. On to the oscillations in my last couple of minutes here. This shows um, several different time snapshots in a single numerical simulation. And you can see the sign of the equatorial jet switches from eastward to westward back to eastward again. In this case, the period is um, about 12 years. Um, this, uh, maybe I'll skip this due to time constraints, but it's just showing the meridional structure of that oscillation. And this is my version of that plot that I showed from the observations for the QBO. So here's the um, zonal average east-west wind um, at the equator uh, and showing the eastward wind and red and the westward wind and blue. And you can see this downward um, propagation of the jets um, like I described, in this case with a period of sort of 4,000 days or so. Um, and so this is the first time that this kind of an oscillatory structure has been simulated in a three-dimensional model of a giant planet. The mechanism, it turns out, is quite similar, not surprisingly, to the well-known mechanism that drives the QBO in the case of Earth, and basically involves the interaction of these convectively generated waves with the mean flow in the stratosphere. And so I probably don't have time to walk through all the subtleties of this, but I'll try to sketch it out in my last minute or so and feel free to ask follow-up questions. Um, so basically we did, uh, first off, analyzed what the details of all the wave types are and how the wave types vary with latitude, with the uh, height and, and, uh, and the model. And they're crucially both eastward and westward propagating waves. And so they propagate up. And then once you have zonal jets, so for example, this is showing speed of either the zonal jet or the wave phase speeds on the x-axis. And this is height here. So this dot, dotted line shows the zonal wind curve at a given point in time. So this point in time is an eastward jet at the bottom, a westward jet in the middle, and then at the very top, another eastward jet. So it's a vertically stacked pattern of jets. And so the east, and then you get um, waves, and the wave phase speed is shown on here. This is from a diagnostic analysis of our 3D simulations. And so we get um, both the westward propagating waves propagate up, the eastward propagating waves propagate up. And what happens is that the westward propagating waves first hit the base of this westward jet and they reach what's termed a critical level. So basically, as the waves propagate up, they're reaching a region where the zonal jet speed is the same as the wave speed. That drastically changes the wave propagation properties, it tends to slow down the wave's propagation. It squashes together the wave crests and it makes it much easier for the wave to be damped. And when a westward propagating wave like this is damped, it deposits westward momentum. However, no such region is reached for, the, for these eastward uh, uh, waves. Eastward propagating waves are perfectly happy to just shoot right up through that region. And they get up to the base of this eastward jet, and then they undergo the same kind of process. Whereas they uh, approach a region where the wind speed is similar to their base speed, namely eastward in this case, the waves slow down, um, their wave crests smash together, and they get damped. And crucially, they deposit eastward momentum. And so um, the sort of this bottom plot is showing the acceleration um, caused by those waves as a function of height um, decomposed into wave speeds. And crucially, so the eastward accelerations are shown in red and westward accelerations are shown in blue. And the point is that the result of this wave mean flow interactions is to cause an eastward acceleration at the base of the eastward jets and a westward acceleration at the base of the westward jet. 
Now, if that acceleration were co-aligned exactly with the sort of core and height of the jet itself, it might just make the jet stronger and not change its, its altitude. But because of this mechanism, instead, you're preferentially absorbing waves on the bottom flank of the jet below the jet peak. And as a result, that strengthens the bottom part of the jet um, below where the maximum of the wind speed is, and it weakens the top part. And so the whole jet propagates downward over time. So this is the mechanism that causes the downward propagation on this class of model. So this mechanism has been well known for the QBO for the Earth, like I said, but it's the first time this has been done for a giant planet. All right, so just to sum up here, so hopefully I've convinced you that um, brown dwarfs and Jupiter and Saturn have certain similarities. Numerical experiments for this class of bodies generally show banded, clouds, uh, banded pattern in the dynamics. So we would expect, even though um, brown dwarfs uh, have, are you know, strongly forced in a sense, they're very vigorously convecting, we still expect a banded structure for them. Some of our models are very Jupiter and Saturn-like as far as their zonal jet patterns, and we produce this QQO and Q uh, and SAO-like uh, structure here for the first time um, due to upward propagation of waves. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much, Adam. Um, Mark. Hi, uh, Mark Hammond, University of Oxford. Uh, so presumably similar models have also produced convectively generated waves in the past. Uh, why is this model different in that it's produced this mechanism? Are you referring to Jupiter and Saturn? Uh, yeah, yeah. So... There's not been that much work done on Jupiter and Saturn, actually, for this type of thing. So um, let me see if I have, well, I can go back to, um, this shows a couple examples of just prior work. You know, so this is an example of a shallow water calculation, which by its very definition is just a one layer calculation that can't represent vertical wave propagation. There's only a handful, you could count them almost on one hand, certainly on two hands for three-dimensional, uh, you know, sort of atmospheric calculations for Jupiter and Saturn. And those calculations generally don't include the stratosphere, or if they do, they don't represent this kind of wave forcing. So, I mean, I parameterized the, the bottom forcing. And other, this is an example of a calculation that I did about 10 years ago, where we produced nice zonal jets. It was from uh, Leanne and Showman, my former graduate student, Leanne Lynn did this. Um, so you get nice zonal jets, you produce an equatorial super rotation for Jupiter. So that kind of thing has been done, but this model was emphasizing the troposphere and didn't really go very high up in the stratosphere. It didn't have enough vertical levels and, and uh, so on. So details like that matter. For the Earth case, I might add, so the phenomenon was first observed, I think, in the 50s. And then there were, it was, the mechanism was understood through very idealized GFD experiments and calculations. And full 3D general circulation models for decades could not reproduce the phenomenon, mainly because the vertical resolution was too low. It was only in the mid to late 90s that finally, the, when vertical resolutions and GCMs were improved to be high enough, did this phenomenon start appearing in GCMs. But even then, not with uh, properties observed. So it's hard to, hard to model. So we'll have time for one more question, if you dare, standing between us and coffee. Um, Emily. <laughs> Thanks for setting me up like that, Vivian. Um, very nice, neat stuff. I'm wondering about the isotropic assumption of convection, because I'm not super familiar with the literature, but I feel like I've seen models before where convection comes up differently at different latitudes because of the effect of rotation. And so I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit more about um, whether there are predictions that it shouldn't be isotropic, and if so, how that might factor into Yeah, this. thanks for the question. That's a good question. So yeah, um, mainly it was made as uh, to just define a clean experiment, basically. So um, the prior work, like this is an example, this top plot is from Scott and Polvani's work, and there's work stretching back to the 70s, um, just for pure 2D or shallow water type calculations, which all make this isotropic assumption. So I was kind of viewing my calculation as a 3D extension of that whole 30-year body of work, basically. Um, but you're right. I mean, so you can imagine two things. One could be uh, that the convection might be non-homogeneous, which means that it can vary spatially. That's kind of what you were alluding to. You could have a for instance, um, three-dimensional calculations um, of the convection in the interior of the Yohai. And I did actually show that you expect the heat flux to vary between the equator and the pole with the heat flux coming out of the poles being somewhat larger. And so one could put that in. Uh, the other way it could matter is that the convection might not necessarily be actually isotropic, you know, that it could potentially have a directionality. Um, and so, but the you know, parameter space there is, of course, huge. So, but one can imagine extending these kinds of models to look at those uh, cases. Is that everybody? I